The Battle of Antietam began in a misty dawn on September 17, 1862. General Hooker, supported by General Mansfield, advanced south out of the North Woods, right at the Confederate line. At Farmer Miller's cornfield, they ran headlong into Jackson's waiting men. The battle raged back and forth as attack and counterattack smashed over the field multiple times. Just as the Union forces were about to carry the field, John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade crashed into them and sent them reeling backwards. Then as the Confederates themselves were about to sweep the cornfield, concentrated Union infantry and artillery fire drove them out. The Federal attacks were, as they would be all day, piecemeal and uncoordinated. Some of Jackson's regiments would find good cover behind a rocky outcropping near the Miller farm. By 9 a.m., the men on both sides were spent. Thousands of dead and wounded men littered the cornfield. Hooker was wounded, Mansfield was dying. 82% of Hood's Texas Brigade were casualties. And this was only the beginning. Together, both armies brought with them over 500 pieces of artillery into western Maryland. It has been estimated that combined, these cannon fired over 50,000 rounds of ammunition during the 12-hour battle. That is slightly more than one round fired for every second of those 12 hours. The artillery fired from every direction all day long, creating an almost continuous and deadly maelstrom. Confederate Colonel Stephen D. Lee said of the fire, Pray you never see another Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg was artillery hell. It was now 9 a.m. and the rising sun had burnt off the blanket of mist. As the first part of the battle was winding down, Major General Edwin Sumner's 2nd Corps was ordered in to support Hooker in Mansfield. General Sedgwick's division of that corps was advancing right at the Dunkard Church and the West Woods directly to its north. Lee was now shifting every unit he could lay his hands on to support Jackson's line on the left. Separated by the fog of war, the woods, and the undulating ground, only one of the three Second Corps divisions struck the rebel line at this point. Sedgwick's division drove the thin Confederate line past the Hagerstown Turnpike and into the woods beyond. And just as it seemed the men in blue would once again carry the field, they were hit squarely in the flank by a Confederate counterattack that included brigades from Lafayette McClaw's division, just arrived in Sharpsburg that morning from the Harper's Ferry action. The Federals were forced back in wild confusion. Half of Sedgwick's 5,000-man division was killed, wounded, or missing. The Dunker Church was now packed with the wounded from both sides. It was now 9.45 a.m. Sumner's other two divisions were at last on the field and about to strike Lee's center, shifting the battle to the sunken road. The road became a natural rifle pit, and D.H. Hill's brigades of Robert Rhodes and George Anderson now occupied it. French's Union Division was the first to hit them. French had lost his way and was uncertain in which direction to launch his attack. When his men began receiving fire from the rebels in the road, he decided it would be prudent to attack in that direction. French's division contained so many regiments that were so new to the army, they had never heard a shot fired in anger. The Green Federals hit the rebel line four times, and were four times forced back. The dead and wounded littered the fields in front of the road and began to tangle the feet of the Confederates occupying it. The sunken road was now like a storm, sucking in units from all over the field. Three more Confederate brigades were sent in to support Hill. Several of the regiments, looking for cover, crammed into the road, adding to the confusion. Then the Union Division of Israel B. Richardson slammed into the road, but it too was forced back. Finally, at 12 p.m., confusion in the road and one final Federal attack caused the whole Confederate position to collapse, completely exposing Lee's center. Union commanders on the field called for reinforcements to finish the rebels off, but McClellan would not allow them to be committed. The armies of Lee and McClellan consigned over 16,000 men to fight at the Bloody Lane. 5,500 of those men became casualties. 
Now, once again, the fighting shifted south, this time to the Rohrbach Bridge.